West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com When in God's name will we do what needs to be done to, if not completely stop, fundamentally change the amount of the carnage that goes on in this country? Second Amendment is not absolute. The president speaking again today, as he did last night, about doing something to increase public safety, which is the government's first obligation. Now, in our coverage last night, we began with the facts and the unfolding massacre, and then we turned to the facts around policy. So, again, we do tonight. We began with people on the ground. We began with the latest facts and the updates. Now we turn to the policy, because if this were domestic attacks from foreign invaders or foreign terrorism, you can bet on day one, two, and three people would be saying, how do you stop the next one? Do you let these people into the country? How did they get the weapons? If somebody flies a plane into a building and kills Americans, you want to say, should it be easy or hard to hijack a plane? This is standard stuff. So don't let anyone trick you or fool you about the idea that if you want to engage as a citizen, as a voter, on how to keep each other safe or keep children safe, that that's somehow the wrong response. Enough of that. So let's get into the facts as there are new calls for action right now. Remember, under Democratic leadership in the most recent election, this current House has already passed two gun safety bills. We reported on them, and to refresh your memory, they passed last year. They would do something that has broad public support, which is deal first with who gets guns, expanding and strengthening background checks. They do not in any way restrict your right to own a gun. They don't make it very hard to get one, but they would try to strengthen the background checks. And what's interesting about this is the House, which passed this, has the mandate of the majority of the public. The House is the part of the Congress that has majority support because each district represents roughly the same number of people. Then they send it over to the Senate. Now that's a part of Congress where it's not majority rule, not in the rules, and not, remember, in how senators are picked because it's not according to the number of people, it's according to states. And that's where these new bills backed by the public from the most recent election were stopped, blocked by a minority of Republican senators under minority leader McConnell. And they represent a minority of Americans. The bills, well, they haven't gotten an up or down vote. And again, to be crystal clear, I'm not talking about whether everyone in the Senate supports them or not. I'm just talking about whether it reaches the floor. That minority group of Republicans in the Senate are using tactics, an obstruction filibuster, so there can't be a floor vote. The person in charge of the Senate, Chuck Schumer, today saying this. There are some who want this body to quickly vote on sensible gun safety legislation. I'm sympathetic to that. And I believe that accountability votes are important. But sadly, this isn't a case of the American people not knowing where their senators stand. They know. 
They know because my Republican colleagues are perfectly clear on this issue, crystal clear. That, by the way, is Chuck Schumer's version of being outraged. This is the second deadliest school shooting in American history now this week. The most deadly was Sandy Hook in 2013, where Republicans also did the same thing. Something passed the House, so it had the public's majority support. There was a president in the White House, again, reflecting a majority vote by the public, and the minority stopped this. Now, Ron Brownstein, who's a nonpartisan political analyst, noted that basically the senators voting for the background check bill represent 194 million people. Those opponents using these obstruction tools I'm telling you about, a meager 118 million. Most people already supported the expanded background checks, and now, as this explodes across our life and culture, even more people are concerned about acting. The Senate is being held hostage by minority rule. And remember, the result is kids in more danger. And we live in a society where kids don't get to vote. Those kids in Texas don't have a vote on this, on what we, the adults and parents of society, do. They don't get to elect their members of Congress. The first graders at Sandy Hook didn't either. These are school children we're talking about. If we, as a society, if our lawmakers can't protect them, if we can't make it so that the majority rules on matters of public safety involving children, who will? When are we gonna do something? I'm tired, I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to, to the devastated families that are out there. I'm so tired of the, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm tired of the moments of silence. Enough. Right now, who refuse to vote on HR 8, which is a background check rule that the House passed a couple of years ago. It's been sitting there for two years. And there's a reason they won't vote on it, to hold on to power. We mentioned Sandy Hook, and now we turn to Marianne Jacob, a library clerk at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut who survived the 2012 school shooting there. She barricaded herself and a class of 18 students uh, and barricaded a door. Uh, I'm sorry you have to do this, uh, but we are trying to talk to people who've been through some of this, so I appreciate you joining me tonight. Thank you for having me. Uh, your reaction to what we just walked through? <clears throat> Uh, you know, it's no surprise. We've been watching it for the last 10 years unfold the same way over and over again. So, you know, my reaction is sort of the continued disgust of someone who uh, doesn't think our elected leaders are acting on the behalf of the people they represent. Um, but, you know, in addition to that, I think all of us are just as accountable because we're not holding them accountable. You know, every single person today in our country is outraged by what happened, but 99% of them are just, you know, what I would call slacktivists, sitting back and, um, you know, just at being outraged. And if we all don't stand up and do something, we're not gonna change what's happening. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And we wanna kind of bridge this uh, so stay with me. I want to bring in someone who served as a governor uh, and ran the Democratic Party, Howard Dean, who has some understanding of the limits of this. Uh, governor, your response. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think we, the Democrats particularly have got to stop the hand wringing and demand accountability from the voters. Um, politicians have not done their jobs. Now, the Republicans extremist wing, which controls the Republican Party, is very much into this and involved. But the truth is the Democrats haven't done their job either because they're afraid. Um, you know, I was endorsed, I think, with every race I ran uh, in the national, uh, uh, when I was governor by the NRA. The NRA is now bankrupt. Uh, they are, some of them are gonna go to jail. It's a crooked organization. The Supreme Court is now in the, thro in the thrall, five out of the nine members are in the thrall of the right wing of the extremist wing of the Republican Party, which is in the ascendancy. The only people that can stop this are voters. So I, I've had enough of your, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I, if you want to do something about this, do something about this. But stop complaining and expecting the politicians to do anything until you make them. It's not going to happen. Yeah, and you, you mentioned that. I, I want to put up uh, Ruben Gallego. I showed Chuck Schumer there and the sort of plaintive approach he took. Um, Ruben Gallego's tweet is um, 
Just to be clear, F you, referring to Senator Ted Cruz in Texas, you and people can read what he said there, and F your prayers, they haven't worked for the past 20 mass shootings uh, about passing laws that would stop these killings. Governor. Now what we need is a bill on the floor of the House, which is controlled by Democrats, which will limit or eliminate ownership of assault weapons by ordinary people that are not involved in the law enforcement or the army uh, and uh, make all kinds of other regulations so that, look, I'm, I come from a pro-hunting state and I'm pro-hunting. I think it's a good way to control uh, wildlife population and so forth. But this is not hunting. This is hunting human beings. And these weapons are completely unnecessary. And in fact, under Bill Clinton, we did have an assault weapon ban, which then was allowed to lapse and has never been heard from since. The NRA is an impotent organization. These people are in the thrall of uh, these right wingers like Cruz and uh, are in the thrall of people who loud people with dangerous guns that they are catering to. And the rest of the politicians need to stand up. And if they don't, we'll need to replace them. And I don't care what party they're in. It is Thursday, the 26th of May of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, just a little bit of jambalaya. Only a little bit of spice in your life, just a little still in a bit of a morose state here because of, well, you know, 10, 8, 7, 6-year-olds getting killed. That kind of bugs me. And I was quite livid watching that presser yesterday with Abbott Patrick et al., where everything was blamed except guns. The readily available gun. Okay. Now let's just be clear here. The shooter waited until he was 18 so that he could go and buy a assault weapon. Then a couple of days later, he bought another one. Had clips with 30 or more rounds in them. You know, the kind of ammo capacity that Democrats have been trying to, well, you know, put a regulation on, but because it's a regulation, we can't have that. And Abbott and Patrick and those, I don't know, boss hogs <laughs> standing up there because there's a thin blue line between order and chaos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because you guys are on the side of chaos, apparently. I don't see much order except what's imposed arbitrarily that has nothing to do with protection and serving. Now, I was quite concerned about a stack going into that classroom and filling it with lead with 20 kids in it and a couple of teachers. But it looks like the shooter did indeed kill the kids and the teachers because he had a better part of an hour to do it while the cops were outside quivering in fear. 40% of that little, little town's budget goes to their SWAT team, their tactical team. And what did the tactical team do? They ran in and got their own kids and spirited them out and left 20 kids in a classroom with two teachers to bear the brunt of the attack. While parents are outside saying, get in there. You got the weapons and you can see in the video. And I know the major cable companies are equivocating. Oh, we can't put a timeline to when this video is. Except a parent who is in that video corroborates what happened. A parent whose daughter died. They tased a parent. And uh, the guy on MSNBC said, well, you know, in these situations, you got to keep people, you know, away from the uh, scene because you don't want them to get hurt. Okay, so what did the cops do? They hurt the parents whose kids are in there being massacred. 
tased them. <sighs> I will note that it didn't, you know, Border Patrol didn't hesitate when they got on the scene and says, oh, there's a class full of Hispanic kids. Let's go in and shoot it up. The kids were already dead, but it didn't stop the Border Patrol from going in there. And I'm not saying that the local cops and the SWAT team uh, didn't go in because they were afraid they were going to shoot the Hispanic kids. When 90% of the school is Hispanic. I'm just saying that Border Patrol didn't hesitate. Okay. Collateral damage. <laughs> Charge the uh, perp with murder. That's how it works. When the cops kill the victims, the perp gets charged with murder. But once again, I don't think that's what happened. I had the conjecture because I know how stacks work. It was used to great effectiveness in Iraq. We had 20 years of experience of it in urban warfare. You know, uh, yeah, there is some urban areas in Afghanistan, and we did take part in it. I think Iraq is the more pertinent example. Because how many stories did we hear about hostages uh, being held by uh, Saddam's Iraqis? And they ended up dead. You go in a room and everybody's a possible possible uh, threat to your life. You don't know if that 12-year-old hiding under the covers has got a gun. You shoot and ask questions later. Hell, we do that. We did that in, in intersections. Like in Fallujah, for instance. I know that was contractors from Eric Prince's operation but still fill it with lead that is our legacy everybody in the world knows it that's why we have the kinds of guns that we have we don't know how to shoot but you know if you can fill the thing up with lead you're going to hit something that's how the americans fight that is our legacy we're known for it it's no secret So the stack was brought home to our constabulary. So I didn't really trust a stack to go in there and be concerned about the hostages. Because, I just gotta say, precedent doesn't bear it out. But instead, I guess this is worse. The so-called Good guys with the guns and the badges and all that training. And I got to say, I don't know how much training that really is. Okay. I had four years of constitutional history and European law and cops get what? 36 hours and then you're a cop. Okay. It's a little bit more than that, but still it ain't four years. And then maybe another couple of years after that and another couple of years after that. And I'm supposed to, I don't know, defer to the cop on constitutional issues? Give me a break. <laughs> All right. So 40% of Uvalde's budget goes to their SWAT team. Every little small town in America has to have a tank. They got their tactical team, so they can have a stack. They play cops and robbers all the time on the obstacle course, but when push comes to shove, what the hell happens? I'm saving my kids and getting the hell out of Dodge. And they want to arm teachers. Let teachers take care of it. Teachers are already taking care of it. Teachers have to teach the kids how to hide, how to be quiet. They even have little songs about active shoot and for active shooter drills. They got rid of Schoolhouse Rock because it made kids hate their parents, apparently. You know, I'm just a bill. They got rid of that. 
Oh, it's going to make kids hate their parents. They'll love government more than God. But we got little jingles so the little kids can know, you know, when there's an active shooter drill, we got to, you know, be quiet so the rest of us don't get killed. And that's supposed to be normal. and We're supposed to just live with it. Okay. Blastocyst has more rights. Okay. They're willing to sa- save an angel baby blastivist. Or blastocyst. <laughs> Excuse me. But after the kid's taken a breath and has lived for ten years, slap them! <laughs> And I'm still convinced it's Dan Patrick that got into the tete-a-tete with uh, with Beto yesterday. When Beto said, it's on your hands. Blood is on your hands. And all those boss hogs got up. But Dan Patrick had the microphone in front of his face. I, I, I heard David say it was the mayor. Could have been, but uh, you could see Patrick engaging with uh, Beto. And then, of course, you know, the, the camera does pan a bit to camera right. And you hear this southern drawl, boss hog, called Beto a sick son of a bitch. While they had the festivities of a pro gun rally. Because that's what it sure sounded like to me, except they didn't mention guns, except that we need more cops. We got to lock the doors. If only that one door had been locked. Now, I made a connection to what I call the circle waste fire. Oops! Geometry again is the triangle waste fire. Where all those women were locked in and then died. A little bit different in the school, uh, ostensibly. You know, you can lock from the outside and push the bar and get out. (sighs) But the shooter did lock himself in the classroom from the inside. And the local tactical unit tased Parents. You can see these guys with their long guns. They got assault rifles. They weren't hiding because they had a puny little forty-five or three fifty-seven Magnum. So puny now. Think of that. And the gunfire is going on in this classroom, and the parents are pleading. So the cops rough up the parents. Texas. All right. Also, Abbott said that more people die in New York. And with all those gun laws, there's been more school shootings and deaths in New York than in Texas. No, there hasn't. There's been no deaths from school shootings. Three injuries. You've had 24 instances of uh, school shootings and what, 200 and some odd dead? Give me a break, you lying gaslighting fool. We got to do something about, about mental health while they cut funding for mental health. They won't do just basics. They no, Background checks? No, can't have it. Red flag laws? Oh, no, that's like taking the rights away from wife beaters. We can't have that. That's our constituency. A constituency of wife beaters. And the women who love them, apparently. Jeez. All right. Just a little tidbit. I heard also reports that the grandmother worked at Uvalde or at the uh, Rob Elementary. So one of the reasons why the shooter went there. And why did he shoot his grandma in the face? Well, apparently uh, mom has a problem with drugs and grandma was evicting her from the house that she lived in. And that must have set the kid off. Who knows? So, can it be prevented? 
Do laws prevent anything? Why do we have laws? Seems like they are have no problem creating laws to make sure that women are under the thumb. Oh, we can't keep women from just committing all these crimes of murder, so we're not going to have a law. No, they're going to make sure we turn into Nazi land. But I tell you, the guns are not the end. The guns are the means. All right. You create chaos, and then you got to have a knight in shining armor with a, probably a swastika on, on the shield to come save the day. It's not by accident that I'm just a bill that is pretty much nowhere to be found. But little jingles to teach little kids active shooter drills are. Awash the society with weaponry and see what happens. It is chaos. So then we got to bring in some authoritarians to, you know, bring some order to the chaos. We'll create the chaos and then we'll come in and save the day. And in the process... Yeah, the burgermeisters and the captains of industry make their money. And the Nazi war machine grinds on and on and on. Okay, I'm done. I'm done with all of them. In fact, there's an opening on the school board here in town, and already folks are saying, yeah, we got to keep these radical leftists from taking over our society. They're just like indoctrinating our kids with these r- radical leftist ideas like representative democracy, apparently. The actual history of the United States. Of course, I stated that the last thing we need is a bunch of seditious insurgents taking over our school board some more. No, thank you. And you got to be pretty much of a Nazi if you think an Eisenhower Democrat is a commie. I mean, if you want to call a Bircher a Nazi, which I have no problem doing. Of course... It was stated very clearly that they need a school board member that will represent the constituency of this little former sundown town. And what is that constituency? The ones who threatened my life when I asked if the Dixie swastika was going to be sold again at the Rooster Crow Parade in the summer? Mm Mm-hmm. When... A few years ago, the graduating class, in their graduating class picture, and several of the boys did the Pepe symbol, the white power symbol, the little circle with their OK sign with their hand. And I was jumped on and threatened once again with violence because all those little kids were doing was playing the circle game, and I'm just a commie Antifa for bringing it up. How dare you? We're going to kill you. We're going to beat you up. And who got suspended for bullying? Me. I didn't threaten one person. All I said is, okay, come beat me up. He threatened us. All right. Something's got to be done. And uh, shaking hands with Nazis is not going to do it. Not working. Thank you, Beto O'Rourke, for showing the world what a sham that presser was. Okay. Wow, look at the time. We've just really ranted today, and I didn't intend to. Well, let's uh, go ahead and get into the curated part of the show and give you a rundown about what we have in store for you. Well, of course, at the top, yeah, outrage increases at the GOP for blocking sensible gun safety regulations and legislation even after the Texas school massacre. They continue to vote down these measures. On the rest of the menu, the Biden administration is cited against the airline industry over crew breaks. The state bar of Texas sued to punish state attorney general Ken Paxton 
for lying to the U.S. Supreme Court about election fraud. Yeah, that Ken Paxton. Talk about constituency. They keep electing that crook. What does it say about the people voting for him? And police suspect arson in a fire at one of only two Wyoming abortion clinics left. They suspect. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the United States threatens sanctions on anyone in Sudan impeding or blocking the transition to democracy. And Russia says it will pay its foreign debt in rubles, a move that is likely to be seen by foreign investors as a default. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link, across the page there at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And do, do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. If you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds to us once a month, that really helps us pay our bills. So do, do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. It would really help. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And I'll tell you why. Because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then uh, you can find that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. So follow me at Justice Putnam on Twitter for that. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, wherever podcasts can be found. And of course, you can access the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library at the Internet Archive at archive.org. All right. This first offering here, and I guess we're going to have to abbreviate somewhat because I just ranted and ranted and ranted. But this first offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is the town street sweeper is uh, outside making a bunch of noise. But that's good because it's sweeping the streets. This first offering is by staff at the Associated Press. <laughs> OK, go on by. It's pretty loud. The Biden administration has sided against the airline industry and urged the U.S. Supreme Court to uphold a California law that would provide more rest and meal breaks than airline crews are guaranteed under federal rules. The U.S. Solicitor General and other administration officials said in a filing that California's law is not preempted by the FAA's authority to regulate airline safety. A federal appeals court ruled in 2021 that California was within its rights to apply a law on employee rest and meal breaks to the airline industry. The original defendant, Virgin America, was later bought by Alaska, Alaska Airlines, which asked the Supreme Court to overturn the decision. The administration asked the court to deny the airline's appeal to hear the case or send the matter back to lower courts for further consideration. The Trump administration had sided with the airlines when the case went before the appeals court.
Jeff Flyberg of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. The State Bar of Texas yesterday, Wednesday, sued to punish State Attorney General Ken Paxton for his failed efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election based on bogus claims of fraud raising a new legal danger for the Republican the day after he secured his party's nomination for a third term. The state bar asked a Dallas-area court to impose unspecified discipline on the state's top lawyer, alleging that Paxton's petitioning of the Supreme Court to block Biden's victory was dishonest. The formal accusation of prevention professional misconduct makes Paxton one of the highest profiles attorneys to face a potential threat to their law license for a role in Donald Trump's effort to delegitimize his defeat. The petition to a Collin County court came the day after Paxton defeated Texas Land Commissioner George P. Bush. In a Republican runoff election, the victory sets him up for a general election contest with Rochelle Garza, a South Texas Democrat and civil rights lawyer, as Paxton is also facing a trial over long delayed state fraud charges and a separate FBI investigation prompted by criminal allegations from the attorney general's own staff. Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. An abortion clinic set to open next month in conservative Wyoming was damaged in a fire yesterday, Wednesday, that police believe was deliberately set, possibly by someone seen running away from the building carrying what appeared to be a gas can and a bag. The blaze damaged the inside of the building under renovation to house the clinic in Casper, the second biggest city in a state where opposition to abortion is widespread. The clinic, which also planned to provide other health care services for women, had been set to open in June as only the second place in the state to offer abortions. A person who called authorities before dawn saw someone running from the building with what appeared to be a gas can and a black bag, police said in a Facebook post. Investigators were reviewing video footage from the area. Julie Burkhart, the clinic's director, said clinic organizers had been receiving harassing emails and telephone messages. The building had video cameras that were functioning and police were given access to them, she said. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is 60 Second Science. I'm Tulika Bose. You might know that a leaked memo recently revealed that Roe v. Wade could be overturned, which could have massive implications for women's health. 
What you might not know is how your trusty smartphone could be used to enforce that. I'm here with Sophie Bushwick, our tech editor, who is going to go a little bit more into depth about the ramifications of this. Hey, Sophie. Hi. So tell me about this. What's going on? So in the wake of news about the potential fall of Roe v. Wade, it came to light that you know, about 13 states have what are called trigger laws on the books. So these are laws that would kick in as soon as Roe v. Wade would be overturned and would immediately uh, make abortion um, partially or entirely illegal in those states. Some people were worrying online about the potential need to delete data from their period tracking apps. I decided to look more into this question, can your period tracking app reveal information that could later land you, you know, land you in court. And what I found was period tracking apps are really the tip of the iceberg. The real issue is that your phone gathers a huge amount of data about you every single day. And yes, that data can be used to reveal if you're pregnant and if you um, plan to or do obtain an abortion. Tell me a little bit more about your phone being this like major tracker of information. I know it records a huge volume of data, but What are some of the things that your phone could be recording that could then be used against you in court? Most people carry their phones with them wherever they go, and uh, your phone tracks your location. Every time you look something up on the internet or you use an online browser to make a search, that can be recorded uh, by the companies um, whose apps you have on your phone. If you have a period tracking app on your phone, you might enter data on your period, and that can calculate your fertility. It can even tell if you're pregnant before you know that yourself. Your phone can, can figure things out, like how often someone goes to the bathroom. Okay, that is wild. Um, Your phone can tell how often you go to the bathroom. If you know which data to pull from a phone, uh, yes, you could figure out what what somebody's bathroom habits are. A phone is a very useful surveillance tool. It it is dystopian because we don't have a lot of legal restrictions on what data companies are allowed to gather, on how long they're allowed to keep that data. Okay, so we know that if basic activity like seeking reproductive health care becomes criminalized, um, experts have said courts could even issue a warrant for your device, which would then reveal all of that personal information you were talking about. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? That's right. If somebody is uh, involved in a court case, um, their phone, the information can be extracted from it, and then all that trove of data can be used uh, against them in court. But something that's actually a little bit more worrying for uh, privacy experts is the way that law enforcement can sidestep the need for a warrant at all. Something that has a lower bar than a warrant is a subpoena, and that can be issued to um, a company that collects data, and you wouldn't need to get the data directly from a person's phone in that case. You could just get it from the company that gathers the data. I would like to know if there's precedent. Has that been done before? Have people's devices been used in a, a case of subpoena or anything like that? Yes. Uh, the Probably the most well-known example is a case in Mississippi where a woman had a miscarriage. It was suspected that she had induced it. So in order to find intent, Uh, Law enforcement used information from her phone that showed that she had searched for how to induce a miscarriage. And as a result of this, she was indicted for second degree murder by a grand jury. Now, in this case, the charges against her were later dropped. But in a post row world in a state where abortion is illegal, you could very easily see um, a case where people who experience a miscarriage then become criminal suspects. I want to talk about the period tracking apps and I want to talk about HIPAA. So are period tracking apps protected by HIPAA? No. So HIPAA is a law that basically says, you know, your healthcare provider can't share your healthcare information without your consent. But a period tracking app does not count as a healthcare provider. It's not covered by HIPAA. So period tracking apps have the ability to sell your data to data brokers and to other entities. Obviously, the most secure option is to not use one at all. But there are uh, apps that prize security more than others. And so you do want to see what their privacy policies these different apps are. That's really good to know. And my last question, are there ways you can protect yourself right now? 
So some tips include if you want to hide your browsing activity more effectively, um, you could use a browser that's privacy centric, like Tor or Bravo. Or you could, if you're using another browser, you could use it in um, incognito or private mode. Um, what you can do if you really want to hide your activity more effectively is use a VPN or virtual private network that prevents your internet service provider from snooping on your your web activity. Another thing is that you you want to do in general is just have good security. You want to protect protect your phone with a strong password as opposed to using, you know, a biometric unlocking mechanism. Um, you should protect all your accounts with strong passwords. One of the best ways to do that is to use a password manager so that you don't have to remember a bunch of different long strings of symbols and letters and numbers. Uh, we'll put a full list of tips in the transcript of this podcast as well. So just scroll down to the end and you can see some ways to keep yourself safe. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thanks for having me. For 60 Second Science, I'm Talika Bose. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. As president, George Washington understood his own limitations and was not reluctant to rely upon the counsel of others. He proved a good judge of talent, selfless in advancing such promising younger men as Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Washington also began the custom of consulting with his principal department heads as a group which practice led eventually to the creation of the cabinet, an important feature of American government to this day. By the time Washington retired from the presidency in 1797, he had established that the power of the president was vested in the office, not in the individual who held the office. He attended the inauguration of his successor, John Adams, and insisted on walking behind him at the close of the inaugural ceremonies, thus demonstrating the peaceful transfer of power under the new constitution. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. If and when the Supreme Court reverses Roe, who will suffer? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. And the list of who will suffer is a long list that includes victims of rape, victims of incest, victims of domestic violence, teenagers, low-income workers, women of color, immigrants without documents, really all members of marginalized groups. In contrast, for the wealthy, the right to choose will, for the most part, remain relatively intact. They will be able to access that health care. They will have the wherewithal to travel. That's obviously not the case for women who literally can't afford to miss work, for single moms who can't leave their kids, for women who don't have money to travel and live in a state that is criminalized buying abortion pills. What are they to do? Studies show that women unable to access abortion disproportionately are women of color, who, denied an abortion, are much more likely to live in poverty, be unemployed, and be unable to escape violent male partners. In addition, a nationwide abortion ban, one study shows, would increase pregnancy-related deaths by 21 percent, 33 percent among black women, who already are two and a half times more likely to die in childbirth than white women, which means that overruling Roe may well initiate a death spiral for women, as well as a potential death spiral for constitutional rights. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself.
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Did you know that sometimes photographs have the power to change the course of a labor struggle? Well, that's what happened on this day in labor history. The year was 1937. Detroit news photographer James Scotty Kilpatrick came with his camera to the River Rouge Ford plant. He was one of several reporters who joined a crowd that was gathering at the Miller Road overpass at Gate 4. In the crowd were clergymen, along with Walter Ruther, and the men and women of UAW Local 174. The women were carrying leaflets emblazoned with the message, Unionism, not Fordism. Their plan was to hand out the literature to workers departing the plant during a shift change. As Kilpatrick set up to take photographs, Henry Bennett arrived on the scene. Bennett was the leader of a large group of men from the notorious Ford Service Department. This hired company police force was tasked with crushing union activity. They demanded the union supporters disperse. When Ruther refused, Bennett's men charged at the union leaders, brutally beating them. Realizing that the reporters were witnessing the violence, the Ford security team then began to snatch reporters' notebooks and smash their cameras. Kilpatrick was able to hide his negatives in his car. Bennett claimed the union provoked the violence. But Kilpatrick's photos told a very different story. They showed union members bloodied and bruised, including seven women. The photos of what came to be known as the Battle of Overpass helped sway public opinion in favor of the union. A hearing before the National Labor Relations Board looked into the anti-union retaliation. Faced with this public pressure, Ford had no choice but to sit down and negotiate with the members of the United Auto Workers Union. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at west coast cookbook and speakeasy metro shrimp and grits thursdays we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the rogue river in the rogue river valley of southern oregon on the west coast of the continental united states of america where it is currently 60 degrees fahrenheit already and we are expecting a high in the low to mid 80s, which is considerably cooler than yesterday because we were over 90 here at the mothership in Rogue River proper. Generally cloudy today with winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Partly cloudy early tonight, followed by cloudy skies overnight with lows in the mid 50s and winds will be light and variable. And then overcast tomorrow with highs dropping even more. We're only supposed to be in the low 70s with winds out of the west at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And it looks like we might have some rain later on in the day and the evening hours. And then about a quarter of an inch is supposed to drop on Saturday alone with some more on Sunday. We'll see how that ferrets out as we get even closer to the weekend. Grass pollen is rated very high here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region remains good at 27 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is high at level 7. Barometric pressure is, oh, I, it's rising. It is rising at 29.86 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 74%. Now, oh, I failed to mention that we do have an update on confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon. We now stand at 441,067 confirmed cases and our deceased have increased by five and now stand at 541. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 68 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 70 degrees and mostly cloudy. 
Rome is 88 and fair. Kiev is 68 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 72 and clear. Hong Kong is 80 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 70 with heavy rain showers. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 54 and cloudy. And New York, New York is 65 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd, crowdsources from around the world. Edith M. Letterer from the AP brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. The United States urged rapid progress from military to civilian rule in Sudan and threatened sanctions on anyone impeding or blocking the transition to democracy. Richard Mills, deputy U.S. ambassador at the U.N., said Washington supports a joint effort by the U.N. political mission in Sudan, the African Union, and the eight-nation regional group, known as IGAD, to facilitate a Sudanese-left shift to democracy. Speaking before the Security Council, he strongly encouraged Sudanese civilians and military to use this process to move quickly on the framework for a civilian-led transitional government. Sudan has been in turmoil since an October military coup upended its short-lived transition to democracy after three decades of repressive rule by strongman al-Bashir and his Islamist-backed government were removed in a popular uprising in April of 2019. The military takeover sparked protests demanding a return to civilian rule and a crackdown on protesters by security forces. The coup also sent Sudan's already fragile economy into freefall, with living conditions rapidly deteriorating. The two main protest groups, the Sudanese Professionals Association and the Resistance Committees, have long demanded the removal of the military from power and the establishment of a fully civilian government. The generals say they will hand over power only to an elected administration. They say elections will take place in July of 2023, as planned in a constitutional document governing the transitional period. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles rester Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Associated Press staff bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia says it will pay dollar-denominated foreign debt in rubles, a move that is likely to be seen by foreign investors as a default. The U.S. Treasury Department, led by Janet Yellen, allowed a license to expire yesterday, Wednesday, that permitted Russia to keep paying its debt holders through American banks. The license applied to American investors and international investors who have 
dollar-denominated debt or bonds. The Russian finance ministry said it will pay in rubles and offer the opportunity for subsequent conversion into the original currency. The ministry did not give a time frame for that to happen. Russia has not defaulted on its international debt since the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution when the Russian Empire collapsed and the Soviet Union was created. Russia defaulted on its domestic debts in the late 90s during the Asian financial crisis, but was able to recover from that default with the help of international aid. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver